Okay, we're starting out the second lecture in the seminar Anti-Fascism with a Human Face conducted by Professor Julie Reche at the GCAS Summer Institute at PAC. Let's welcome Julie. Thank you. That's it? <laughs> That's it. Okay. That's what we got. Recording. Can yeah, I have a second slide? Huh? Second. Yeah. So the question of uh, subordination, and this is what we're going to talk today, a human who obeys, obeying and subordination, obedience and subordination, they're usually seen in a negative context and with implication that we supposed to develop independent thinking and act in accordance with our own consciousness, with our own independent thinking. But Mm, and the most horrifying and frequently used example of the of subordination and obedience and how harm, harmful they might be is the mm, events in Nazi Germany and as a rule the problem with the Nazi Germany is is seen as a fact of this massive of mass obedience of uh, German uh, people and population and this to the third Reich so the problem which is seen here is the problem of obedience. They obey to authorities instead of making their own independent and presumably correct decision. And uh, it is claimed get that the genocide, the um, massive extermination, uh, would not have happened if there has been no massive uh, civil obedience. And the way out of the similar uh, threats is seen in the formation of ways not to depend on authorities and to form um, independent thinking and independent reasoning. But today I would like to present a different position and introduce this uh, in a different way this ideal of independent thinking and uh, to, we'll try to understand if it's possible if the can I have next slide if um, independent thinking is even possible and I'll try to present um, obedience what we call obedience in a positive light so it doesn't mean that there is no negative aspects but there are all also positive aspects and so first of all let's think if uh, independent thinking is mm, even possible and it looks like um, we are evolutionary programmed um, to conform to others and to inherit others opinion in in our worldview so our worldview is not our worldview it's a shared worldview and in 1950 the famous ash solomon ash um, experiment was conducted and his task was to examine the reaction it's well known he, he wanted to examine the reaction of individual of a person to a, a wrong erroneous behavior of the majority so if majority is wrong, what would the individual in these circumstances, uh, how would they behave? And in the course of experiment, each participant um, was shown, can I have next slide? Each participant was shown a card with uh, two lines on the first, on the first stage. And um, yeah, a card with one line and on the, on the, next, on the next stage, um, that followed, uh, he was showed the card with the three lines and only one of those three lines uh, coincided in late with the line on the first card. And the participants then were asked which of the three lines on the second card was the same as on the first card. And during the first stage of the experiment, participants made, when participants had to make their own decisions, all of them answered correctly. And, but during the second stage of the experiment, when participants first um, hear the wrong answer, um, most of them answered in a in wrong way. So most of them follow this erroneous if they saw that other people, many other people before they give their own answer, present a wrong answer, they, they were given this the same wrong answer. So, and um, so false answer. And overall, next slide. 75% of the participant obeyed to this erroneous opinion of majority and repeated this wrong answer. And 
the total share of erroneous answers was um, well was within those participants is 75 percent so most of them and the next so we follow the wrong wrong ideas of majority and it was more interesting experiment the next one um, the results of this ash experiment was uh, refined in uh, fMRI study uh, in 2005 by burns and it doesn't matter it just um, the picture they present some uh, Very details. no it's just uh, figures three-dimensional objects doesn't matter they the principle is same like with the lines they are uh, just three di three-dimensional uh, figures so uh, within the this uh, fMRI study participants uh, had to mentally rotate three-dimensional objects different in shapes and then uh, in the same principle they're supposed to uh, say if those three-dimensional figures were correct coincided or they were different and just it's hard to do to conduct the same experiment within the circumstances of fMRI studies so it was a bit changed and generally these fMRI studies uh, consist were consistent with ASH basic findings uh, so most of the people uh, repeated the wrong answers if they were first presented was first um, knew that other participants gave the wrong answer but the what fMRI study uh, has shown that this conformity, the social conformity, the, um, this feeling that we're supposed to follow the ideas of majority, it uh, arises on a really deep level of, um, it not on a conscious decision making, but on a level of unconscious perce perception. Because when uh, when participants later were asked, next slide, when yeah, when participants later were asked uh, why they gave the wrong answer. Uh, most of them, 82%, uh, um, claim that they was they were really sure that they are given the right answer, and this means that they really saw a different the three-dimensional figures as as correct ones. So this is what they saw. They didn't lie to confirm, but they really saw them as um, as same. So uh, this means that this we have this um, common thinking, right? We can't even uh, we can't distinguish where where are our ideas and where are the ideas of other people because we follow unconsciously on the level of perception the way how we perceive the world it's not our ideas it's just common shared ideas so this means that under the pressure of public opinion their very perception has altered has changed and they really saw those different three-dimensional object as same so result of this experiment showed that social setting they alter uh, individuals perception of the world and such conclusion can also be interpreted as demonstrating that the need to conform why it was developed during the evolution or it even it was at the very beginning that opinion of other is coded in a very deep level usually uh, the way they present the the fi these findings that it, it alters the very perception but if you go deeper this means that we don't even have our own perception that the very thinking is always um, common thinking we, there, there are no us what we think it's like us <laughs> it's more illusion so the thinking is collective in its um, in its basis it's not individual process and individual opinions we can claim that um, is kind of a secondary phenomena and it's only possible to it can be only part partly uh, individual it's kind of alteration perversion of a basic basic um, level of of uh, common thinking and maybe through the process of reflection we um, can alter what we uh, what is accepted as a default but we never know because the way we perceive it, even if you're really sure that this is our idea, and we sincerely think that this is our correct thinking, it's, we don't know. <laughs> and so what we what we call critical thinking and what we call our own thinking, we can feel that it's our own, we can protect it, but we don't actually <laughs> know, and there's no way to find out if it's... So it's more, more complicated than we usually think. 
and the next slide and it's very um, easy to explain um, why the thinking can be only common thinking because um, I like the idea of uh, Matthew Lieberman who is social cognitive and neuroscientist and he claims that the, the most important need of human being is uh, sociality so because a human being they are born premature more premature than any other mm, mammals they need uh, others extremely need uh, extremely need others even more than they need food and they need uh, shelter and this is why the um, um, our ability our need to conform our need to f uh, to be uh, to be to form some unity with uh, with others it's basic for us and uh, on level on a, even on an unconscious level not only on a conscious level because humans are profoundly social beings and Lieberman even inverts this Maslow uh, pyramid of needs where the basis the most uh, important for survival was physiological like food and he claims that uh, Lieberman claims that love and belonging so this sociality is basis because if uh, if the infant would not be would not will not connect will not have they have this need in a caregiver um, they will not have a food the caregiver is someone who provides them with the food so food and unconsciously this is um, the hierarchy of needs it functions this way even throughout all our lives the need in others is more profound than need in food because it's it's crucial for our survival and it's crucial and there's nothing we can basically do and he claims next slide that uh, Matthew Lieberman claims that belonging might seem like a convenience we can live without but our bio biology is built to thirst for connection because it is linked to our most basic survival needs so because we are profoundly social we experience the social pain uh, the pain of um, there's something wrong with our connections where we are not connected mm. we experience uh, this social pain much sharper and when someone is dies when something wrong with our connections with this unity mm. we experience this pain more mm, extremely than physical trauma and we know it because if, if you ask someone to um, to tell you what it was was the most painful experience in their life they will never tell you that they broke their leg but they will tell you that someone they love died or something happened so this is what the most but it's just a separate person and it's still painful because the, we are these connections not the separate beings it's just the illusion and so we this is why we feel the social pain more profoundly because it's linked with our survival this is we need to experience more sharply because otherwise we wouldn't survive we are social needs so this is kind of programs around evolution and in Lieberman words by activating the same neural um, pathways that causes us to feel physical pain our experience of social pain helps to ensure the survival of our children by helping them to be to keep close to their parents and later we reproduce this principle in romantic love that we need one someone who will belong to us who uh, will belong to and this is what we Mm, this ideal model of fusion with a parent this is what we seek uh, throughout our lives and uh, because humans are profoundly social a human behavior is mainly determined by their basic needs to be part of society to be to form this one with uh, with society and this explains why a person is initially predisposed to inherit not even to inherit the opinion of uh, the social environment but doesn't have their own so we need to be one and we need to share these um, ideas because to stand out and to have a different opinion a different your own means different this is painful this is this pain that we don't want to have and um, so and this different opinion is a threat for it possesses this threat of being rejected by the collective so it's potentially painful so we can claim that um, there is critical thinking and our own reasoning but it's supposed to be painful at least so this is how you determine if it's painful or not if it's painful it's your own if it's not it's <laughs> not your own mm. so and next slide coming back to the uh, obedience and um, 
But the Hannah Arendt was the most pr provided us with the most uh, significant, I think, analysis of subordination and obedience in her work, Banality of Evil, where she analyzes the 1961 trial of Eichmann, who um, was directly responsible for the genocide of Jewish in Europe, and he was involved in the mur murder of six millions directly involved in the murder of six million Jews. And Eichmann did not repent of his actions during the, um, the court sessions. And he was justifying himself by just mer that he was just obe obeying orders and acting in accordance with uh, legal instructions. So what he did, he was trying to match the, what, we all, what we always do, the social environment. In conclusion, uh, Arendt book provides us with is that Eichmann, uh, Eichmann is um, frighten, frighteningly, it's, okay, she's talking about frightening, Eichmann's frightening normality, so he was normal, and he was not the, uh, the terrible person that we, we might imagine he was being. And she states that, um, next slide, I think, yeah, this is Eichmann, and next so um, she states that half a dozen of psychiatrists uh, had certified him as normal and one of them found that his whole psychological outlook, his attitude towards his wife, children, mother and father, brothers, sisters and friends was not only normal but most desirable. And even the priest, minister who visited regularly Eichmann in a prison called him a man with uh, very positive ideas. So Eichmann was not at all the fanatical uh, anti-Semitism, and he personally didn't hate Jews, he Jews, he had some friends among them, and he sincerely believed that his consciousness was clear, and uh, he, he claimed that he was a not a dirty bastard in the deeps, depths of his heart. So moreover, he assumed that he would act contrary to his consciousness in case that he would not um, do what he's supposed to do, what, do what he was ordered to do. So his conscious, the way he felt that his conscious is clear and that he did the right thing. And he, that he perceived himself as, as a kind person and same did the psychiatrist and the priest. Because he really was. And this is the result. And uh, so Eichmann, yeah, um, although, but although Arendt declares the banality of evil, uh, evil I was talking about this yesterday, uh, she. So the banality of evil means that we can't distinguish it. If it's banal, we can't distinguish it from acting in accordance with consciousness. If it's banal, it's indis indistinguishable. But in her analysis, she nonetheless guided by the attempt to find what is wrong with Eichmann. Either is he's too naive, he's overly trusting, he's incapable of independent thinking, and other attempts. But Ultimately, she fails to find anything unusual in Eichmann. But in spite of that, that she failed, she still retains this um, reproachful gaze yeah, that is something wrong with him. And she has this hope that his monstrosity can be detached or allocated, so it can be eliminated. There's supposed to be something wrong with him. This is the last hope that something wrong with him and we can fix it. And Arendt is afraid to admit that Eichmann is profoundly indis indistinguishable from those who, like Ara, Hannah Arendt herself, happened just happened not to be involved in a gen genocide. So was not just in these circumstances, and this is the only the only difference. So she didn't ha didn't happen to be there. That's it. So um, really, really scared to admit it. So the feature. The only feature that distinguishes uh, Eichmann from uh, Arendt is the very fact of his involvement, that he was involved. And this renders her in, incapable to recognize that the mechanism of uh, genocide was launched uh, by the normalcy of Eichmann and those who are you know, his like, and, but, and not by their specific deviation. And uh, by the way, this next slide. Yeah, the trial of the operation of the Eichmann capture 
for his trial that was uh, held um, by Israel. It was held illegally, so not in uh, correspondence with uh, legal norms, and uh, it involved not most human methods. Uh, after Israeli Secret Service they became aware aware of his um, where where he is, where Eichmann is hiding, uh, they sent a group of people who um, catched uh, catched him, put him in a car, and uh, put him on the floor under the blanket, and they put a a gun into his mouth and warned him that they will be they will shoot him if he will resist. And Elf, but Eichmann expressed the um, willingness to cooperate. He was very cooperative. And still, the way they behave with him, they put him in a safe house. They um, ch they chained him to the bed. And Eichmann was giving this complex uh, anesthetic that he was not able to move. He was remained conscious, but uh, he was not able to escape. And um, they, con they continually um, questioned him for nine days, and uh, then he was heavily sedated by this Israeli doctor, and um, he was. Uh, they put the Israeli pilot clothes on him, the costume, and they, this is how they took them to the airport. And the trial of Eichmann, the end of it, um, the, the trial that was uh, called to stop the evil of Nazism. Uh, it ended in a verdict of the death penalty, so they basically killed him, and um, so they did they did same right what what he did to Jews they uh, he, they did to him they killed him following the legal rules, not even legal but a bit illegal and but this this time under the geese under the flag of a good and the triumph of justice, but the triumph of justice is just repetition of the same, of the same thing. And um, so, experimental study of subordination, this question started to be um, really. Uh, mm, there were there were done lots of research concerning it. And the next slide. A couple of months after the trial, Eichmann trial, um, with this high moral outcome. The famous uh, Milgram experiment was conducted, and the purpose of the uh, Milgram experiment uh, was to find out whether people um, just following the orders of authority are capable to extreme cruelty towards those who they don't uh, don't hate personally. So the answer, w the question for uh, Milgram was, um, could it be that Eichmann and his millions? Uh, accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders. And the fact that humans are being uh, profoundly social and by default don't have uh, their own um, opinion correlates with the fact that we are um, yeah, initially inclined to trust social authorities, uh, to, to trust someone, the, our uh, social environment and those who represent the um, those ideas of the social environment, so socially sig significant person, the social authorities, and uh, and then to adjust to this uh, requirement, adjust our behavior to this requirement that are posed by a social environment. And the extreme negative side of this process was revealed by uh, Stanley, by Milgram, obedience experiment. And he was interested how easily people could be influenced by committing um, by committing those cruel acts, for example, in uh, Nazi Germany. So, um, next slide. Yeah, we can watch the movie. Is it clickable, the box? Yeah, we can watch the, it's five minutes about the, how the Milgram experiment was conducted. Can we try? <laughs> No, it's not. Okay, I'll just um, tell you. <laughs> yeah, put, try, try clicking that. No. Mm. Okay, so uh, during the course of experiment, there was an actor and a participant who uh, who drew straws to determine their roles. Either the participant will be a student or a teacher. 
but in fact the participant always got the role of the teacher so those who were invited to participate to participate in experiment were always teachers and the other the actor was uh, had the role of his of role of a student and at the beginning of the experiment uh, the teacher those participants were given an uh, explanation that the purpose of experiment is just to reveal new methods of learning and memorizing information and they will act as the teachers but in reality the purpose of experiment was to study the behavior of a um, person um, who receives specific instructions from authority and um, but those instructions such instructions that are um, uh, don't coincide with the internal behavioral norms if they, if they can overcome the behavioral norms, norms if the authority uh, wants them to. So students, those actors, were tied to an armchair and um, was attached electric shock and, and then the teacher, these participants, uh, were taken to another room from which they, they didn't see the um, student and but they supposed to give them uh, supposed to give them this tasks for memor memorization so uh, and with each error the participants of so the teacher is supposed to press the button uh, and the student re would receive the electric shock of uh, 45 volts first and in fact there was no electric shock and the actor just was uh, the students were just played that that they are in pain and that uh, they are receiving the electric shock and shock and after each error the teacher needed to increase the voltage by 15 volts so with increasing voltage the actor played an increasing di discomfort and played a great pain and then brought um, broke into screen and uh, the increase in voltage occurred up to 450 volts so uh, yes it's it might kill you and when the subject began to hesitate and the uh, teachers began, began to hesitate the experimenter just assured that he takes the full responsibility for the experiment and for the safety of a student and that experiment must be conducted so the result of the experiment were shocking and uh, <laughs> 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 Can play on a word <laughs> yeah the 65 percent of teacher continue to the highest level of 450 volts and and they had this machine that was shown the um, it, uh, it stated that 450 is uh, that level so they understood that it's uh, and but and additionally the student was the screamed so they uh, were playing this pain uh, unbearable pain and 65 percent they are killed the student basically understanding that he's in a great pain and this is the deathly level of voltage and this was absolutely contrary to the prediction of the experimenter of M M Milgram himself uh, he saw that just a small percentage uh, would do that not 65 and contrary to the predictions his predictions most of the uh, teachers obeyed the instruction conducting the experiment and shocked the student with the uh, electric current. And the conclusion that is drawn usually from this experiment is that obedience is deeply integrated in human beings and this is usually proclaimed the, with the, mm, in a context of this in the late motive of exposing the dark side of human nature and uh, rarely attention is given to the positive side of human obedience to yeah there is a positive <laughs> side <laughs> in this situation and the attention is rarely given to the positive side of this obedience and conformity in even Milgram himself and this experiment is uh, really popular to uh, to cite and to so even if Milgram experiment did expose this dark side of human nature this dark side is only flip flip side of the more general basic so to say bright side of us and um, yet yeah, the, the usual leitmotiv that we have to get rid of the obedience and use the critical thinking but first of all it doesn't work because there is no um, our own consciousness there is no uh, personal consciousness no critical thinking and so 
the only way is to see uh, and we can't get rid of obedience I'll explain why later uh, so and this is not a completely bad thing first of all so trust in social authorities and um, non-individual thinking we usually see it as some in a negative context and this horrifying shocking uh, results prove this but we can see it, we can try to see it from the other side so um, we rarely yeah, notice that um, yeah well so after that Milgram experiment was conducted in um, it was not only in the post Nazi um, Germany world that this experiment would function like this and following the result of uh, his uh, experiment Milgram concluded that okay, can I have the next slide yeah Milgram himself concluded that after witnessing hundreds of ordinary people submit to the authority in our own experiments, I must conclude that Arendt's uh, conception of banality of evil come closer to the truth than one might dare imagine. The ordinary person who shocked the victim did not out of sense of obligation and oppression of his duty as a subject and not from peculiarly aggressive tendencies. This is perhaps the most fundamental lesson of our study. Ordinary people simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part can become agents in a terrible destructive process. So this is the um, this is what Milgram himself uh, the conclusion that he himself uh, comes to. And uh, in the next slide, in 2009 was a recent. Um, uh, recent uh, replication of Milgram experiment so just a couple of years ago and his result corresponded to the result of Milgram uh, original experiment so just demonstrating that mankind didn't change uh, so, so didn't learn any lessons so and n not even sure that if we were talking uh, a lot about the Nazi Germany and we are horrified by what happened and if we probably if we were, were learning uh, were trying to learn but we didn't learn anything maybe it's impossible to learn to to change something and maybe what we were trying to change was the wrong thing and and before that before the last uh, replication Milgram experiment was uh, reproduced in many uh, countries and the first, uh, he claimed that he wanted to, uh, he wanted his initial experiment to be only the first stage of uh, many other experiments. He conducted it in uh, United States, and he later he wanted to conduct it in Germany. And his hope was that German people are more, uh, are more obeying than uh, American people. But he was wrong. The every, uh, wherever he he was uh, conducting it, the results were the same more or less same and mm, with a different uh, not depend not so much depend on the gender and on the country so more or less it's everywhere like this and even in 2009 it's still same and the next slide Julie do you know the gender breakdown or uh, do you have the data for the gender breakdown of that no the and it's more very but there's no hope here <laughs> okay okay that's <laughs> wrong question <laughs> yeah so, mm, and uh, in 2014, this is the m even more uh, important research than uh, the Milgram research. Alex Haslam and uh, his colleagues they published important study where they analyzed the post-experimental reports. Uh, those teachers who were participating in uh, initial Milgram uh, experiment, they were, were supposed to write uh, after experimental uh, reports. Mm. and as a result and Haslam just analyzed them and his colleagues and as a result they conducted that in his analysis and Mil Milgram later wrote a book about his thoughts and the quote that uh, you saw is the general his general leitmotiv that it's banality of evil we are obeying and this is terrible and we have to do something with this And but yeah uh, so we'll try to rethink it in a bit different way and this is what uh, Haslam will help us with. As a result, uh, they conducted, uh, his team conducted the analysis of Milgram um, this post-experimental reports 
and they came to the conclusion that Milgram himself, uh, in his book and in his papers, they, he incorrect, incorrectly introduced the general emotional state of the participants. Uh, he focused on a state of stress that participants were stressed during the experiments, those teacher, uh, because they had to do it. They were instructed to uh, shock uh, students and to cause the pain. For example, in his report on experiment, Milgram wrote, I observed a mature and initially poised businessman under the laboratory, smiling and confident. Within 20 minutes, he was reduced to twitching, stuttering, wreck, and was rapidly approaching a point of nervous collapse. In the next slide. Yeah, this one. So this is how uh, Milgram presented the report and how, how he analyzed how he saw this, this situation, that people were stressed. People didn't want to do that. Initially, it didn't correspond what they did to their um, initial um, understanding and um, principles of behavior, but they still did it because they, were, they, were, they obeyed the orders. And Haslam, uh, Haslam came to analyzing this himself and with his team, uh, this post-experimental report, he came to a more frightening conclusion that although the state of stress was indeed present, they were stressed, the teachers were stressed, the overall emotional atmosphere was pleasure of participating in an experiment. That is, uh, the participants not only mm, killed their victims, not only murdered them, but they also enjoyed it. And it's most of us, because this is the experiment was conducted many times, and if it shows 70, more than 70%, it means it's everyone. And there's no way out, because uh, throughout all this year, if it didn't change, and we were so, uh, so frightened by what happened, and it didn't change us, this means that, but at least we enjoy it. So, um, yeah, and it's a good thing. So 84% uh, of responders, according to Haslam, 84% uh, of this post-experimental -experiment survey were glad or very glad to have, uh, to have taken part in the experiment. For example, one of the participants wrote, I know we have a, uh, can I have the next one? Yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, I'll read you. One of the participants wrote that I'm very delighted to be a part of the project. I have often thought perhaps I was the subject, but I could not be any happier. I have been waiting very anxiously for the report to really put my mind uh, at ease and curiously satisfied. Again, I will say I'm very happy to be part of this project. Last but not least, I'm sure uh, my effort, my cooperation have uh, been of somehow useful for the project. And this was 84% um, of, res of uh, responses. So people were happy that they participated. They were happy uh, to, um, to participate in this project. And only 1% of responders were sorry, or very sorry, that they participated in the experiment and they well killed other students. And almost none spoke of uh, remorse. No, no one um, was felt sorry for this. So the result of uh, this Haslam study do not suggest that every person is a sadist, that, that we enjoy uh, violence toward other, but on the contrary, but those are bad news as well, that we don't enjoy it, but still it's not a good thing. Because what participant of the experiment enjoyed was not causing harm to others. Uh, the participants of experiment, they um, enjoyed the social participation, participation in a socially significant pro project. And the procedure itself that presupposed harming others, it indeed, this harming others that they heard these screams, it indeed causes, causes the stress, but participants' stressful condition did not intervene with the pleasure, so it was simultaneously stress and pleasure. But even uh, we can claim that the Mm, the stress, it, it emphasized the, significant, the significance of what they are doing. And because if for the sake of the project one have to resort to the stressful um, action, because we initially we don't want to hurt others if, we are, if they didn't do uh, something bad to us. We don't want to, but if we have to, and uh, we sacrifice our own needs, and we do it, so this is how we feel it's significant, it makes us happy. And 
yeah, so this means for them the state of stress itself means that they do something important and they feel and they enjoy it. And this is what you feel, for instance, if if a person walking by and there is the danger that he or she will be crushed by a car and you push her, him, really hard, and you hurt the person. But this is how you know that you have to do it to sacrifice your basic interest and not to hurt the people. And this is how you feel you did something important. This was the same. And throughout all the uh, events in uh, Nazi Germany, it was the same. It was stressful but significant. And this is how Eichmann also describes that he first, when he found out about those gas chambers, he felt really sick and this was terrible. But this is how he felt that he he, he didn't act, that uh, yeah, he had to do it. It was something significant. He has had to. Okay, we'll come back to this. And um, next slide. No, wait, this one. So, um, Haslam recognized, uh, he um, he reinterprets, um, reconsidered Milgram conclusions, conclusions that he made on the basis of his initial experiment, and Haslam uh, suggests that uh, what his experiment exposed, uh, uh, Milgram experiment exposed, was not the willingness to submit to authority, not so the willingness to admit so to authorities, but rather the human predisposition and the need to cooperate, this extreme need to cooperate and to be a part of society. Uh, and to cooperate with those, so authorities uh, are those who are identified with collectively significant goals and values. It's not a separate person, it's a representation of socially, so social values, of someone who is articulating what is important for the of the social community. So Saslam commented on Milgram experiment that it is it is this self same identification with a noble cause that led his participants to prove willing to administer what they thought were lethal lethal shocks to a helpless stranger or then ultimately to feel happy about what they had done. So the pleasure experienced by the participants was the pleasure of social cooperation and the sacrifice, the pleasure when you sacrifice your personal interest, you don't want to harm others, mm, we have to sacrifice this uh, initial need to uh, socially sig significant goals because they thought they are participating in the socially important project, learning, memorization, and this is what, if it is what it takes, this must be great stuff <laughs> and the great, great results. And in a way it was. So, um, yeah, so this is how we feel. This is what we, how we do it, how we come up with these terrible results. Because for a noble cause, usually, we never do, we never kill people, especially six million Jews, if you don't see that uh, it is in the name of humanity. That this inhumanity is only a small part of the general. Uh, human cooperation and so Haslam research does not justify a person and just not uh, does not present her uh, as innocent and sinless but rather it reveals this um, truth that hard to accept that human evil is not is not only banal as Hannah Arendt believed and wasn't even capable to recognize but it's the ultimate manifestation of a good thing of a cooperation of uh, humanity is worse, even worse. And um, so Haslam resort to um, inhumanity only, uh, yeah, he claims that um, only if we feel that we feel that it's significant, then this is, this is why we uh, resort to um, inhumanity. And this means that humans, they do inhuman acts only if it's justified by the superiority of humanity, only if it's in the name of humanity, only if humanity is what it takes if you feel it. So we are naturally very really good <laughs> people, but this is the, uh, this is our problem. And in humanity, when it's these terrible acts are placed 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 in a context of humanity and serves its purpose. And then next slide is the same logic. <laughs> yeah, the same logic uh, was at work in Nazi. Mm, genocide, uh, and when visiting Poznan in October 1943, uh, Rafe Fuller assess Himmler, 
he addressed uh, SS officers uh, who were responsible for carrying out operation to exterminate Jews, and he the way he encouraged him them, it repeats the same logic, because he reminded them that their cause is noble, in the name of law to people. So uh, I'm reminding, um, I am now referring to the evacuation of evacuation of Jews, the extermination of Jewish people. It is one of those things that is easy to say. Easy say the Jewish people is being exterminated. Every par party member will tell you, but none of them has seen it happen. Not uh, not one has had to go through with it. Most of you uh, men know what it is like to see 100 corpses in, in, lie side by side, or 500 or 1000. To have stood fast through all this and at the same time to have reminded a decent, to have remained a decent person have made us hard. This is an unwritten and never to be written page of glory in our history. All in all, uh, however, we can, stay, we can say that we have carried out this most difficult task in a spirit of law for our people. And the next slide. Yeah, this is very important as the Himmler addresses the group of soldiers. So those are people who seen the corpse and uh, the glory, and um, he encourages them. But it's important here. Maybe we can we can't see, but those are just normal people. Yeah, just like sad and tired, and and they had to be encour encouraged. And this is what they did. This is how they survived because they were satisfied they were doing it in the name of humanity and just like like everyone of us so the yeah well the message is said here <laughs> that there is probably nothing we can do but the warning is also that uh, probably the next large scale catastrophe of uh, human of humanity will be caused not by something that we recognize as inhuman, something that we see as a terrible, terrible thing. But there is no doubt that the next ex massive extermination of people will happen in the name of humanity. Yeah, so this is more, is more dangerous. And my, maybe that those who are called misogynists today, <laughs> maybe here is the, and those who are called fascists, because if the, like on the next le last lecture, what I was telling, trying to tell you that the extermination of Jews were presented in the name of humanity because were they were not human, were presented as not human. And the precisely the same logic like we fight in today all the time after Nazi Germany, we fight in with fascists and we recognize uh, Hitler and fascists in anything. <laughs> it's possible to turn this logic everywhere. So in the and this is the problem, or the same logic with misogynism, the same logic that uh, protection of animal rights, all the good, great causes, and really something that is progressive, it's true, and something that is truly human, and something what um, what helps us to survive and forms our community and makes us human. But at the very the back of it, the other side of it, this is um, yeah, the terrible thing happens sometimes. That's it.